Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This is episode 97 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Nikki Schauder, co-founder of Permaculture Gardens, about permaculture. You'll definitely want to hear her story of how her children influenced her decision to start growing in the permaculture method. The plant profile is on eastern redbud trees, and I share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events. This episode, we're joined by Nikki Schauder. She's the co-founder of Permaculture Gardens. Welcome, Nikki. Oh, so glad to be here. So glad to have you. And such a big topic for us to cover today, permaculture and the principles around it and why somebody might want to grow in that method. But before we dive into that, Nikki, let's get to know you a little bit. So I wanted to start all the way back at the beginning with baby Nikki and ask, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? Oh, definitely not. Uh, In fact, I have a black, (laughs) I had a black thumb. And I always tell people that the black thumb is a myth because I remember my, in the Philippines, my grandmother would foist an orchid on me and say, this is your orchid. You'll take care of it. And I would never, it it would always end up she having to take care of it. And um, until now, I'm I'm just learning. I'm hoping that I I still have a little bit of her gardening gene in me in that orchid world and that I can um, one day have my own orchids at home. But far from it. And now here I am helping people, helping families grow their own food and grow their own gardens. So uh, it's quite a journey for sure. That's so wonderful that you had a mentor in your grandmother who loved orchids and loved plants. Was she a big influence for you? I think I always have had her at in the background of my gardening work. And whenever I f- find a milestone, <laughs> I'm always quick to report it to her when I see her online. And uh, she's now 100 years old. And I feel like some of that longevity of hers is attributed to the gardening efforts because she was always every day active, making sure that her garden was in top shape. It was a tropical garden. Her main crop was a mango from her mango tree, which you know meant hardly any maintenance at all since it was a fruit tree. She would just harvest it and maybe smoke. So in the Philippines, they we she would um, she would burn under her tree, and that's what I remember. Uh, but most of her garden, the rest of her garden was ornamental. So that's my origins, but I've always had a, an environmental bent in me, like planted in me that I've always had that. And I would see the garbage. We don't have, um, garbage collection the way we do here in the States, in the Philippines. And when garbage is collected, it's brought to a landfill and that landfill, the main one, there's several ones is called Smoky Mountain. And you can imagine from the title of that um, that name, it's for Re- Smoky Mountain for a reason because it yeah. the, the gases from there start to smoke, and there's a whole f- economy community around it. And I used to visit it in college to help um, teach, you know, just basic education to the, the the schools that were there or the the families that were there as part of an outreach uh, group that I was in and. You know, there's a different culture when you walk in there um, from in the third world, going into a landfill and having these communities there. You don't you don't cover your nose. You don't you pretend like you don't smell anything because that would be offensive to them. So um, that's always been in my heart that I needed to do something about the environment in that way. And then fast forward here, I met my husband. I didn't know how to grow anything. And our first child was diagnosed with failure to thrive. And she was 18 pounds for what seemed like forever when she was born. And finally, we found out through a lot of testing that she had allergies. She had food allergies. And 
we had to, at that time, 15 years ago, there was no, there was hardly any, were hardly any cookbooks that were allergy free in the market. I believe there was Mm -hmm. one. (laughs) And then to learn all that, it was like, and on top of being a new mom as a side job, it seemed, wow, such a big deal. And my husband, Dave, was also suffering periodically from food poisoning or these bouts of like he would throw up after um, uh, after eating at a restaurant and his belly just couldn't um, take some of the, the food, you know, in the kitchens, um, can, you know, in, in restaurants that we eat at. So there was definitely something going on there. And it wasn't until our second child was born with allergies again, and they were there were a whole host of it. My first was allergic to peas, beef, peas, beans, um, egg, dairy, so milk, gluten. Um, and then my second was fish. Oh, and then tree nuts and nut peanuts. And then my second was tree nuts, peanuts, and fish. And we would have to call the paramedics to come when they were blue in the face. And we didn't we didn't get the, the Brenadryl wasn't working fast enough. So that really gave us pause to question the food system and question why there must be something wrong here because why is there a rise in peanut allergies why is it not just our kids and why all of a sudden and so we decided to start growing and that's where I'm like okay channeling all my inner grandma and her her law and my my husband had had some experience from his own um, mom and he had been a junior gardener so he had some experience but we still failed terribly until we came upon the word permaculture Hmm. that's such a wonderful journey to share with our listeners nikki i'm so you know moved to hear about your experience with your children and that mind body food connection right so that's a lot of motivation for people to want to grow their own food um, so let's talk maybe a little bit about some of those early failures and where did that come from? Were those that you just wanted to grow everything at once and tackle everything or how did you start off your own food journey? Well, we were just really growing tomatoes first and um, we put those tomatoes in the ground. We didn't know what we were doing. We just put them in the ground and we expected them to give us a big harvest. And, you know, we didn't know... I. I knew I didn't want to use pesticides because that was the whole reason or chemical fertilizers. That was the whole reason that we were growing our own organically. But then there was not much knowledge in the internet at that time. And we were just fumbling and thinking, what's wrong? Why are, why are we only getting three tomatoes out of this several plants that we planted and several of them died. And then we had this basil that I didn't know what was an annual or perennial or that, basils just automatically died after they bloomed (laughs) so I thought I had killed it so if there's if if anybody here is listening and you have a plant at your home and you feel like you've killed it you know it's it's not your fault a lot of the time because there's just stuff that we don't know each each plant is different Mm -hmm. and um that was yeah that that was the beginning of our failures and then on one of our bookstore dates we found a book uh, written by the Strawbridges. I'm not sure if anyone still remembers this uh, docu series. It was a British reality TV show where they they look they uh, follow around this family and they this family created a book and in the book there was that permaculture and then so we investigated it a little bit more and were surprised that it was used to green the desert and that just opened a whole other door of. <laughs> more exploration for us like maybe if it can green the desert we can use it to grow our food our few tomatoes and make them not die Hmm. and from there you dove i guess head first into permaculture and before we explore that topic a little more uh talk about your home garden and where you are located oh thank you so much for asking we are located in the suburbs, the far suburbs of Washington, D.C., in near the Dallas Airport in a place called Sterling. So it's a tiny suburb town and uh, lots of we're in a row house. So townhouses right smack in the middle of a row of townhouses. And we live on one fortieth of an acre. 
our living space is 1,600 square feet, but we grow on a, a little over 1,000 square feet in our front and our backyard. And yet with that space in our backyard mostly is where most of the space is, and it's shaded. Um, and yet we manage to grow at one point. I can't say that right now because we're about to move. And so we're not as uh, on top of all the uh, of all the growing but 25% of our, our fruits and veggies came from the back and the front yard. And that's that, amazing. Yeah, you can see trellises and mm -hmm. espalier trees and ornamentals and, and perennials mixed in. Yeah, I was going to say for a small townhouse garden to produce that much food, that's terrific. Yes, 300 pounds to be exact. <laughs> and were you dealing uh, or under an HOA? Yes, for sure. So our first um, foray into this, we was, of course, the sun was in our front yard. So we were trying to trellis the front yard. We grew um, pumpkins like in an arbor right in the front. It was hideous because in terms of garden design, it was totally a small space with a big trellis and it wasn't um, aesthetically pleasing for sure. But if we were looking just at production, we were thinking of all, all the pumpkins that we would get. And then we did so we got cited for that. We took the trellis down, brought it to the backyard, and then we got cited for um, growing grapes up our brick wall, which was south facing. It had the nicest sun. It was nice, warm, what we call microclimate, which is getting all the heat of the sun at that, those times that the grapes wanted it. Mm -hmm. And it was so productive. Concord grapes. My twins would go out every day and just pick them and eat them with the slip skin uh, uh, seeds and all. <laughs> every day and so that we had to go to to the back to the back where it is not as productive but um yeah so definitely learning how to do edible landscaping in the front and um, now we get away with a lot more than we think you know we should because we are growing lots of leafy greens in the front and a fig tree is still there we have fajoa trees um so Yes, there's there is a lot of learning through how, what is HOA acceptable, and we also went and brought some fr some moms who were also eager to grow their own food in in the village uh, to the HOA board and explained to them what we wanted. But uh, <laughs> I wanted to channel, but that was it. Like they they didn't quite understand it, um, and I know some cases in Maryland where they've actually my friend Nancy Lawson, the humane gardener, her. Her family has been able to turn the, the tide on the laws of HOA restrictions on gardens, um, but we we just did what we can, and now um, they go over. It's more the aesthetics that our HOA is looking for, even okay. though <laughs> in writing they say no um, no vegetables. Um, it's more the aesthetics, so Swiss chard and and a lot of yarrow cascading down <laughs> down the the brick and everything. Those are the kinds of things they like to see. And for um, yeah, for the aesthetics, you want to keep things pretty, but you can always tuck in a few edibles and herbs, and nobody knows, right? Exactly, that's what we're doing. Yes. <laughs> so let's turn now to permaculture and maybe define the term first for our listeners. Well, permaculture. I like starting actually by saying what it's not, because I think from there, when I say what it is, it makes a little bit more sense. And um, when I talk about permaculture, I try to think of, well, what does the conventional system of agriculture look like? And when you think about it, it is very much like what Annie Leonard, the Greenpeace director, calls the story of stuff. It is a very linear way of, which is the story of stuff is a little um, video that she produced on, you can find it on YouTube, where she um, talks about how a toy, the, pr the, the story of the production of a toy starts from the extraction of resources from the earth. So there's oil and coal and, and lots of natural resources used to create these plastics, and then they're produced in a facility, distributed to the big box mar marts where we consume them, and they stay in our homes for an average of six months before we dispose of them in the landfill. And the story of stuff is very similar to what conventional agriculture is, is this unilateral, linear way of producing a tomato in a very mechanistic way, extracting from the earth, 
a lot of its nutrients without regard for feeding back or t- stewarding that that um, the natural resources, producing them in you know facilities or <laughs> rows and rows of monoculture, distributing them to the big box, the big the big stores, our groceries where we consume them, and then forty percent of what we consume. We, we don't consume, we dispose of them in the landfill. And that's not what permaculture is. Permaculture is a cyclical economy. It's a cyclical system, even a spiral one way of looking at the way you create these, what Bill Mollison, the, the one who coined the term, um, would call a persistent, permanent systems, let's see, for persistent human existence existence, permanent systems for persistent human existence. So there are, when I took my permaculture design course, our teacher, Wayne Wiseman, asked each one of us to come up with our own definition of permaculture because it varies from person to person. But I, for me, I feel that the thing that sums it up is that this vision of a, a cyclical system is important. And then a, a formal definition for me would be that it's a design system so design is very important based on observation. Observation is very important, which ties your home with your garden, with you, with all the animals, ultimately with the whole community, working with nature and not against it. Mm-hmm. And it's ba- yeah, and it's based on there's another thing that makes um, permaculture different from yesterday. I had this question on Green America: What's the difference between permaculture and regenerative agriculture? Is that permaculture is based on ethics and these three ethics are earth care, stewarding the earth, caring for the thing that would um, be, uh, allow us to do the second ethic, which is people care. So we never exploit people in the process or um, compel them, enslave them to work <laughs> for us. And then fair share, that the abundance, because nature is naturally abundant and this kind of growing and, and creation, this kind of design of these systems is very creates the creates an output that far exceeds the input from that abundance we can share it with those who don't have and i think that that's what makes permaculture so beautiful it's so holistic and integrative and it's it um it hits all the all the the spots in my life that i think are important so permaculture the term itself is relatively recent but maybe some of the principles have been with us all along Absolutely. but just hasn't been paired together right in under one umbrella yes that is totally correct and if we need a term in order to define what we mean and that it's just you know human language this is what it's for but yes if our ancestors have probably been practicing this without needing that term for many years and now we need the term to show that um, the, the way that we design things, we feed into a system, whatever input it is, let's say we, we grow our vegetables, when they come out, whatever scraps that we have, we feed them back into the system in the form of compost, or we, we harvest seeds. For instance, the first year we can bring on um, a load of topsoil to just get us started, or we, we purchase the seeds a few years, and then at the end, you're trying to aim for, you're able to produce the seeds and be able to um, grow your own seeds to use next year. Now, we're all, it's, it's a process. We're all aiming for something that's ideal like this. And it's, it's a journey for sure. I'm not at the point that some of your other permaculture guests like Michael Judd are. Um, and that, and that, I feel like that's why I'm a good person to introduce this subject, because perhaps it's a daunting term for somebody who just wants to grow their own food and it's not it's not it really is you use what you have and that's one of those principles of permaculture use what you have and do what what you can with what you have right now and if all you have is a patio go into your pantry and take some beans and start sprouting something and and grow your own microgreens so yeah that's right start Yeah, I think that's so important, Nikki, that it's not dogmatic. You don't have to start, you know, fully from scratch, fully from the beginning and do it 100%. You could do it step by step and that it is a learning process and that like you um, are such a great example of somebody who's on that journey and then teaching others behind you on that same journey. Yes, thank you. So if I was to start 
a permaculture garden and say I lived in a suburban or urban townhouse or row house, what would probably be my first steps for looking at what resources or land I have available for growing? Your first steps for looking at what resources or land you have available for growing. So did you say suburban townhouse, just like me? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So in permaculture, we have this idea of the different zones of use. And a zone of use simply means how frequently you have um, visited a place. So your home could be designated zone zero because you're always in your home. (laughs) And then zone one would probably be a little bit outside where you would put your kitchen garden, you step out your kitchen, you can grab a few herbs and bring them in. Zone two would be a little bit further away. You'd have a you know a little bit more to walk. Maybe that's where you put your vegetable garden. Zone three is where you put your berry bushes and more of the annuals, maybe some chickens. Zone four would be mushroom rods. So you get the idea. It's It's frequency of use. And these are not necessarily concentric circles around your home. These could vary. Some zones could be just in one corner, depending on where you are. So first to identify in your plot of land, maybe take your plat map if you have it, or go out there and measure what your backyard is, and then draw it on a grid pad, um, or photocopy your plat map, and then put it on a grid pad. And then uh, designate what your zones of use are and always uh, start with zone zero first. So if you're just beginning, zone zero is a great place to start. And that's where we start our our GIY, our Grow It Yourself members, is we have them start with microgreens first because it gives you that confidence to then later start your seedlings once you've grown and eaten your own microgreens. but and if you were like us, and we were so excited, we're like, the microgreens is not going to cut it. You know, it depends on your level. Then we started thinking about the raised bed and, you know, kitchen garden first, the things closest. So as we move to our new place, I'm sure we will be designing with the whole property in mind, identifying what those different zones are. But already now we have year one year two plans, year three, where we're not going to put everything all at once. We're going to start um, from the things that we use the most first, the, the spaces that we use the most first, and then build outward from there. Does that make sense? Mm, totally makes sense. Yeah. And I like that year by year plan. And I love the term GIY, grow it yourself. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. That Because you, anyone can grow it themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would think that my first step might be to start looking for a fruit tree as a basis for, say, that front yard garden. You mentioned the fig that's in your front yard. So is that where you would start with the upper level, larger foundation plants and then fill in around them? You are right. Yes. So (laughs) this would be year one for us would be definitely as much as we have the zone, the zone zero and we're doing things indoors in the kitchen garden. The sooner you get your trees in, the better, because they're perennials, and you know what they say, pears for your heirs. It is true, because we've been here 15 years. We put in our pear tree maybe six years ago, and we just got a pear last year. So um, I feel like the sooner we get those fruit trees, you identify a fruit tree that you'd like to start with, um, that was the better. And usually in permaculture, we build a guild or a, 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 a suite of players around a fruit tree when we are designing. At least that's how we've, that's how we've taught our, our membership is if you have an apple tree, then think what would this, the supporting players to uh, be in terms of plants and even animals that would support the growth of that apple tree. Um, So yes, you are right in in saying that the trees have to go in. Yeah, you're so right about the pears too, because it it can be up to 10 years for when you see your first pear Wow! (laughs) from harvest. So that pears from your heirs uh, saying is so true. There are some fruit trees like the fig where you could get fruit the first year. So if you're, you're really anxious or you know you're not going to be in a place for more than say three or five years and then move on, you know, maybe think of a container-grown fruit tree too. Yeah. Um, 
that could work as well. That can. And fig trees, when they are, we, we grew, we start our GIY members because we have this fig in the front, right? So we send them as part of their membership. If they finish a module, they, they get a fig tree. This year it was fig, elder, and gumi cuttings. And we teach them how to root them for their own gardens. And the fig tree is one of those easiest things to grow. And the first year we grew it, I remember it was in a pot. It gave us one Of course, the bigger the pot, the better, because you're trying to mimic the ecosystem outside in the real world in your pot. But it gave us one fruit nonetheless, and that was just its first year. And in a container garden, I like creating a guild in the pot as well. So I I can see for anybody here who's growing a fruit tree or plans to grow one in a a container, um, put a a fig tree in a container and then you can fill it in it can be what in the floral world is a thriller filler spiller kind of combination put in um a time creeping time as like your filler and then nasturtiums as your spiller and then if you are a little um if you're not daunted by pruning you could limb it up what they call limbing up where you you make the fig look like a tree with a one leading bark a uh, one leading like stem or stalk or or a yeah a, a tree limb up and then mm-hmm. and then it's it's crown right cuz if you don't prune it that way your fig will always naturally grow as a bush but if you have yeah. that yeah if you have that look oh it's gorgeous so that's what i would suggest for a container growing fig yeah so grooming it on a single trunk yes. to kind of be like that topiary look almost yes. where the fruit fruits held up above but of course still within reach because i've heard so many stories of people who let their fr- fig tree get a little out of control and then you have to get out a ladder which is not yeah. the safest thing that is true yeah but i love your description of the the thriller chiller spiller being a, even applied in a food growing situation and the beauty that it's bringing to the garden so it doesn't have to be you know just rows and rows and rows of lettuce or something like that and then um, fallow during the winter time so is permaculture also doing it season by season and making sure that there's something always growing yes so if permaculture definitely wants you to get the most um, bang for your efforts so the most amount of yield for the last least amount of effort and so we want you to be able, you want to be able to sustain this, your ex- human existence throughout the year. And so to do that, there's a lot of components that come in there as well. You know, some things that just go like you know, under the umbrella of, of permaculture, soil, science for sure comes to play. And soil is just booming in day by day, there's something new to be learned from soil. So making sure that your soil is always covered year round with something, and that might as well be something that you're eating year round as well, you know, and then in the winter time, um, covering that soil, even during the winter time and always having a perennial, um, if you can, in each garden bed, so that the soil in that garden bed is the microbes in the soil in that garden bed can still rely on a food source of some perennial in that bed uh, to feed off of during the winter months. So for our listeners in the mid-Atlantic area here, primarily zone six and seven, what are some edible perennial plants you would recommend? Uh, Edible perennial plants. So asparagus, rhubarb, um, it depends on what, so in permaculture, we also call, uh, we also have this other concept of, and this is just barring from different, different fields, you know, um, ecology primarily, but there is this, this concept of the, I'm going to put out a number, but not, that doesn't necessarily need to be seven, seven layers of a food forest. Now, some people have argued nine, uh-huh. um, but seven layers of a food forest would be um, your canopy layer, your sub canopy, your or understory, what they call an understory. So a big, big tree, uh, a, 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 a shorter tree underneath, a shrub layer, and or what they call an herbaceous layer. That's a layer that's more um, like the herbs or, or 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 but lower than a shrub. 
then you have ground cover that covers the soil and that could be edibles like creeping thyme which came back so for me perennial um is thyme uh, cardoon for me is is a perennial um creeping thyme strawberries are a perennial the edible that you can grow and that that covers the herbaceous layer and then you have the root layer and for root layers i mean there's some you can have some that stra straddle the uh, the two edible versus ornamental spheres, like dahlias. They have edible tubers, but they're also you know beets or carrots that are in the crop there. But they're not they're not um, they're not perennials. They're annuals. Rub uh, Swiss chard though is even though it's biennial, <laughs> I think that for me. From what my experience is, it's pretty much perennial because it's year four and it's still in my garden. And coming back, I have to prune it a little bit because some of the bigger stalks look a little bit hideous. But it's it's there. It's herbs like sage, lavender, rosemary can come back. Those are the herbaceous layer. And then we have a ground cover root crop, vining layer. So then in vining, we have what edible perennial so i know may pop i haven't i have tried may pop but it died for me so mm. there are some oh, and you mentioned the the grapes that you grew earlier yes very good yes the grapes would be perennial vines um have i covered everything i think i have the other two are mycelial layer which would be the fungal layer <laughs> so your here's my other my husband's other tip is if you can grow mushrooms along this is the other theory that he does it in terms of whenever he grows a mushroom in a bag say we we grow lion's mane on a regular basis because we like the um the effect that lion mane lion's mane has on you know brain power and remembering things so when the ba bag of mushroom spawn is spent he will crumble all of that spawn into the soil and that is like providing one one layer fertilization and sometimes those mushrooms will pop up again like oyster mushrooms will pop up in my garden bed but there's some that are meant for for more for growing in, in straw and in and in, in garden beds i'm not sure what they are right now but um yeah that's how we incorporate i guess i guess the mycelial la a layer aside from inoculating our our garden beds or our seedling trays with mycorrhizal fungi which helps extend the roots of plants and then the aquatic layer. So in our backyard, I didn't have an aquatic layer to begin with. And neither do you, if you have a small backyard like ours, I didn't have zone four, you know, and I didn't have an overstory was maybe in the commons area. It wasn't in my property anymore. So I only had an understory and that would be pawpaw and gumi. And then my other trees around my fruit trees, my pears and my uh, plums were all espalier dwarf varieties. So. Um, I wanted to introduce an aquatic layer to this mix of, of um, to, to introduce more diversity because my di more diversity in your backyard means more stability. So during the pandemic, my boys who were then three and five were bored. So we have six children, but the bottom three are twins who are, who are three at that time and three to four years old. And then Simon, who is, was three years older than us, so six. And so I told them to get busy and dig out a little pond because I could see water coming from my washing machine going out into the garden and pooling in a certain part of the garden. And it was just getting really wet and soggy and over there. So I said, why not just intentionally make this a pond and pool the water over there? And I'll just put some BT dunks if they're mosquitoes and, and see what happens to diversify and give them something to do. So we just dug out a pond. We didn't make a big fuss over it. We just tamped it down with our feet and <laughs> to provide a pond layer. We didn't buy any external pond layer. And of course, and I don't use any chlorine or bleach in my washing. So I knew what I was putting in there. The soap that was coming out was just soap. It wasn't uh, soapy water, soapy, dirty water. And it was very diluted at that point when mm -hmm. it got out. So here I am with a new pond, and the very next day, a frog comes in and visits it. So 
it it provides more diversity if you can get more of that diversity um coming into your garden that's that's what those layers also create is filling in those space niches in your backyard and uh, diversifying your plants um, is Uh what makes that garden productive it's interesting to hear about the layers theory and i was going to say for a tight urban location or like suburban townhouses like you're in I think that that overstory is your actual structure, right? That, that is it's, right. it's creating yeah. shade. Um, so it is almost that giant tree layer creating shade that the rest of you uh, are growing under at that point. That is right. That's correct. Hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about diversity that you were just getting into. And so you're not going to do a whole front yard of, say, fava beans. Mm-hmm. It's going to be layers like you described and things coming and going over the season. So it's not like conventional agriculture where you're planting one crop, then harvest that one crop at once, and then put in a new crop. So it's a little bit different. So it actually sounds to me like a little more work. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk about how conventional farming is supposed to reduce the amount of work. So it's, you're doing all one harvest at once and that's, you know, you're batching Uh, your chores basically in conventional Mm -hmm. agriculture so in permaculture you're doing just a little bit on each thing every once in a while is that how it works well we still batch because one of the other principles of permaculture is um called stacking stacking functions (laughs) one thing has several functions one element has several functions or one um one process, so when we, we do seedling trays, we do loads and loads of seedlings. I think, I'm looking at my tomato seedlings right now, my husband's tomato and broccoli seedlings right now. Um, and they, and we set them out. So it's it's still batch work, but it's, um, it's batch work of, uh, in a more regular basis. So what happens maybe in conventional agriculture, if you are a strawberry farm, then you just have Especially, well, strawberries are perennial. So you guess you have one season that you're harvesting it. Um, we have different kinds of strawberries growing. So we have June-bearing strawberries. We have ever-bearing strawberries. And so we're, we're trying to, how often do you eat, basically, is the question. If you eat just like once a year, which we don't, then that, that system makes sense where you're, you're doing one harvest uh, a year. But it's not just, and we don't just survive off of one crop. So the um, the answer is that we are doing a little bit every day. And honestly, it's not that much. Um, permaculture author and, and a, I would say a dear friend, Amy Strauss, who's one of, I would say, one of my mentors because in permaculture, she wrote the book, The Suburban Micro Farm. And she is, um, she, and we appear in there because we got this, um, we got several of our initial ideas for how to do permaculture in a suburb from her. She would say, all it takes is 15 minutes a day. So if you come to think about that and the amount of time we, we spend on social media, 15 minutes a day is a joke, 15 minutes a day. And of those 15 minutes, seven minutes should be spent observing. So in those 15 minutes, you go out, you plant whatever seedlings you can for the day. And sometimes that 15 minutes, not even every day. You can do like an hour one day and then you can take off um, some of the other days, right? So you you can plant your seedlings one day and then plant another tray the next day and then harvest the next day. So you'll see yourself doing it on a regular basis. And so as we did this, we found that we were still missing plant windows. And so were our clients from um, our Grow It Yourself program. So my husband, who's a software engineer, he he decided to create an app, which is not yet launched. So it's just in beta being used by our membership. And so that nobody misses a planting window and with the several crops that we've got planned, because it only takes a little bit of time, but you have to remember it, right? Um, you can plug in your zip code in this app. And then when you plug it in, you plug in what crops you'd like to grow. And after you grow, uh, you plug in those crops, it'll show you the planting window. But not only that, you can add these planting windows, when to seed start, when to harvest, when to transplant. You can add these events to a calendar. And then that cal- that planting calendar would will then alert you. you 
put in your phone number or your or and or your email and say how many days before the event you want to be reminded and then it'll remind you not to miss seed starting your bush beans um, this you know this April or May uh, wherever you are in in the United States because it's tied to the weather stations in the United States. Oh, I can't wait to see that app and try it out. That would be so cool. Yeah. So we should definitely talk about the animal side of things. So you had alluded earlier to that frog who came right away when you established your water garden and the other beneficial insects and animals. But we also want to talk about pest control. Mm -hmm. So maybe that deer that might come in and wipe out all your greens or the squirrel who likes to take a bite out of every one of your tomatoes. <laughs> so how do you, are there permaculture principles that um, deal with beneficial and maybe protect some of your plants from marauding uh, animals or pests? Yeah, for sure. So for the deer, we did fences because that was the best way to keep them out. Um, there are principles like the fences are probably one of the most effective ways in our experience. There are other things that you can use, like spraying them when there's a motion detector spray or using a prickly crap trap crop. And one permaculture design, we just attended the last January, we were at the Virginia Biological Farmers Conference and Sean Zadrizlizek, well, I can't pronounce his last name, but he, he's a perme permaculturalist and he was suggesting oh he's and he's in this area so Virginia he said that one effective barrier to the deer was prickly pear which actually <clears throat> actually you can grow here in this climate now so he has a prickly and they grow they grew so much of it that they were able to set they earned a lot from the actual sale of the prickly pear fruit and so that was one, that's one way that you can deal with it. And then try to think of what pest you have and what predator that pest has. So in permaculture, Jeff Lawton, the permaculturalist, who is my husband Dave's teacher, would say, you don't have a mosquito problem, you have a lack of dragonfly problem. And that just points out that we're all connected, you know, and, and that population. And when you have a pest problem, <clears throat> it's just an imbalance of populations because they'll always somewhat be there if you have a diverse planting but you want to keep that population that you don't like the undesirable one in check another way to look at pests is to um, encourage the homes of the natural allies in your garden so in in a school garden for instance we grew tomatoes and then we had a little we had we knew we had these parasitic wasps and that normally you know if somebody sees a wasp it i we they they were pretty friendly you know but normally when we see um wasps in a school garden we think oh my goodness i got to call pest control <laughs> these wasps are dangerous to the children but um what happened was it was a great teaching moment because as the tomatoes grew we saw the tomato hornworms on them. And then we saw a dead tomato hornworm that was infected with the larva of the braconid wasp, the parasitic wasp that does this naturally. So enlisting these allies by growing um, umbellifer family, umbellifer family members of the umbellifer family, such as carrot, parsley, dill. The dill really attract lots of um, and parsley love to attract these butterflies that are your allies in the garden also help to balance out these populations. I love that prickly pear solution. <laughs> <laughs> and that could also prevent some theft from your garden too. When people encounter anything sharp or prickly on their way into grabbing some of your tomatoes too. Yes. Gooseberries, another prickly thing or yeah, mm -hmm. and prickly bushes. <laughs> yep. So um, in our last few minutes together, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the diversity principle and um, if you are growing, you know, enough strawberries to feed your family a handful at a time, right, and then have an abundance, 
Uh, you could freeze it, you know, can it, store some of that excess. But you talked earlier about sharing. So are you in contact with other permaculture growers in the area? And do you do like a food swap or, or how do you guys trade what might be abundant for you? Oh, I love that question because we're seeing it more and more. And surprisingly, even here in our tiny backyard, um, there is a baker down the street who is our neighbor, actually. And we give her and him our lettuces, and they have the best baked goods in Leesburg. It's Dolce Ciabatta, if you guys are, are ever there. They're by the farmer's market. So, And they happen to be our neighbors, and they love fresh vegetables. And then there's trading, and the other gardeners around, just locally, that's what surprises me. I'm not even in the farm yet that we want to... <clears throat> we're, we're not even the farm yet that we want to to live in in the future. And in the suburbs... The other gardener that has a, a plethora of Chinese dates will come in the summer and then uh, trade dates for whatever seeds that she wants. We just got a call from one of the people in our mailing list who's local, and she pastures pork, not commercially, but just for her family and the abundance of pork over the winter. And she says, can I trade these for some fig trees? And for us, fig trees are just so easy to, to root. So we gave her maybe two fig trees and a bunch of seeds that, you know, all the rare seeds that we had, like ashwagandha, all the herbal seeds that she wanted to grow. And she was so floored and we were so, so satisfied with her pork. So these are just a few of the examples um, of that kind of community coming together to just exchange things and, and barter that there's another economy, sub economy that's happening just in this bartering um, of your excess and, and gifting. Yeah, I'd love to hear about that sharing and the abundance of Mother Earth. You know, you're not in a frame set of scarcity where you're hoarding and keeping everything to yourself, but you're sharing and then that grows kind of like exponentially. And then that person shares with you, right? And then that person shares. So it's nice to shift that mindset. And oh, yeah. I also like to hear about underground economy type of thing as well. <laughs> Oh, no, I love that sharing thing, too, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, when we were at, at the Green Festival, we were giving away seeds and our seeds are our calling cards. So whenever we meet someone, it's a packet of seeds. It's how we say hi to you. <laughs> and and I feel like that, you know, the number of times people have said that packet of seeds you gave me, that was the best basil and all these these stories of and and putting these school gardens together is another another way where we are not paid for them but the fruit of that is our kids you know saying for the first time um mr harbert that's their teacher you were right the the moon does does appear during the daytime <laughs> you know things like that or seeing a butterfly for the first time these are things that are just invaluable and precious and and yeah once you get the harvest Anybody who, who harvests, the, then they realize, wow, it's free. Like it's for, you can get as much. And all it took was us starting this garden and you can get as many, you know, tomatoes as you want. You can bring home because you're part of the garden club. And, and so that is, a, you know, that it's just a joy to see that on the daily basis, especially more often during the summer, the summer and, and late spring months when the kids are still in school or coming back to school too. The harvest. So how can our listeners get in contact with you? Thanks. We are online at growmyownfood.com. Growmyownfood.com. Uh, definitely get on our newsletter because uh, I don't email that often, maybe bi-monthly or if I'm organized, I do it every week. But each email is definitely uh, very thoughtfully put together with the resources I feel like you can use right away and in those that would inspire you to grow your own food medicine and and find god in the garden uh, we also have a host every month we have webinars and at one point i was doing them every week educational free educational webinar every month we have the monthly garden planning webinar or planning session where um, you guys come and you can plan your gardens together uh, we have a pdf and an analog version of the planting calendar that we give away for free on that monthly garden planning session. Be sure to, to join us there. And uh, if you are so inclined, 
we do have our our business is um, is really and the heart of it is really serving our clients in the Grow It Yourself membership. So that's growmyownfood.com slash GIY. But we hope to continue that the conversation about gardening and permaculture gardening there in those spaces. Well, thank you so much, Nikki, for sharing all of this great information and giving us a little primer on permaculture. I know that there's so much more to it. We only like you know, nicked a little bit off the surface right there. So uh, those who want to explore more, definitely contact Nikki. And any last thoughts for those who are thinking about transitioning to permaculture? I love the words of Jeff Lawton, who says, all the world's problems can be solved in a garden. And that's what I want to close with, because I I believe that it's true, because it's true in my life. And I hope it becomes true for you, too. Thank you so much, Nikki. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a pleasure. Plant Profile, Eastern Redbud Tree. Native, deer resistant, shade tolerant, and the perfect size for even the smallest garden. Redbud trees, Circus canadensis, are in bloom right now all over the mid-Atlantic region. The flowers cover the tree's bare branches and, on older specimens, even along its trunk. Not only are the tiny flowers pretty, but did you know they are edible? They taste like peas because the tree is, in fact, a member of the large legume and pea plant family. Sprinkle a few on your salad or on the edge of a dessert plate for added color. When they leaf out, this tree is just as pretty. The heart-shaped foliage also is spectacular in autumn, turning a bright, clear yellow. The seed pods are an attractive display also. They rustle lightly in the wind and look like brown fringe hanging off the branches. These trees do fine in our heavy clay soils and in light shade. They appreciate some protection from the hot afternoon summer sun. In my own garden, the only problem I have ever had with this tree is that the leaf cutter bee likes to come and snip out very precise little circles from the foliage. It's not a big issue and is actually quite decorative. Note that the popular red bud Don Agoff, introduced by the U.S. National Arboretum, is a Chinese red bud. It is popular due to its floriferous habit and it stays small and shrub-like. The newer introductions of eastern red bud cultivars include trees with burgundy, chartreuse, or variegated leaves. They are also bred for shorter stature and a more umbrella-like tree canopy. These include forest pansy, covey, appalachia, and hearts of gold. Red bud tree. You can grow that. new this week in the garden? Well, it's been a rainy one here in the mid-Atlantic and we are due for another freeze in a couple days. So I spent yesterday running around putting cover cloths over some of our newly emerged seedlings and trying to get in my cool season annuals in a protected spot. They should probably be fine, but I want to be better safe than sorry. In the local gardening world, I definitely recommend that you visit the Forsythia Gates at Dumbarton Oaks and Dumbarton Oaks Park. If you've never seen this wonderful display in Georgetown, Washington, D.C., head over now, maybe before or after you go visit those famous cherry trees. Also in the local gardening world, the U.S. Botanic Garden is reopening their conservatory after a few years of closure on April 1st. No April Fool's Day there. It's going to be fabulous to have access to those plant collections again, and I know you'll want to visit soon. An upcoming plant sale you want to know about is at Mount Vernon in Virginia, and you can go to mountvernon.org to find out more about it. It's their historic plant and garden sale on the weekend of April 23rd and 24th. The general public shopping days are 9 to 3 p.m. on those two dates. There's also a member preview, so membership does have its privileges, and you can join in advance or at the door. 
on April 22nd, 3 to 7 p.m. I also want to give a little shout out to our latest listener supporter, Heather Wheatley. Thank you so much, Heather, for supporting this program. In the new book, The Urban Guard by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.